This video is brought to you by Dr. Squatch. Uh, trust me, you'll be needing their soap to wash off the filth after watching this one. Fritz the Cat, the first American X-rated animated film in history. Directed by Ralph Bakshi and released in 1972, the movie took animation towards a bold and new direction that many people at the time found controversial and inappropriate. The movie itself featured a shocking amount of mature themes, drug use, violence, profanity, sex, political upheaval, and what many people consider to be racist depictions, though that is still debated to this very day. Needless to say, Fritz the Cat was a trailblazer that rocked the boat of the world of animation. But despite the people who stood against it, Fritz was a resounding success, making over $90 million from a what is estimated to be a $1 million budget. That was enough to convince Hollywood that there was profit to be made here from this new world of adult-oriented animated films. Following Fritz was an avalanche of adult animated movies that would dominate the 1970s. Heavy Traffic, Belladonna of Sadness, Down and Dirty Duck, to name a few. But for Fritz, well, let's just say Hollywood was eager to capitalize on the success of the first movie with, you guessed it, a sequel. The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat. Where Fritz the Cat was the first American animated movie to receive an X rating, The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat was the first to receive an R rating. But was it actually any good? Was it too avant-garde with its characters, story, and message? Or was it just a way to cash in on a popular trend? Um, you'll find out. So, what are the origins of Fritz the Cat? For the record, I'm going to keep this section somewhat brief, since I've covered this before with my review of the first Fritz movie. So go check out that video if you want some more details. All right, so Fritz the Cat is based on a comic strip of the same name and was created by Robert Crumb. It primarily ran during the mid-1960s and appeared in mature magazines such as Cavalier. The story follows Fritz and his sexual and drug-induced escapades. The comic would eventually get a movie adaptation in 1972 and would gain the title of being the first X-rated animated movie in America, which was heavily promoted at the time. On the poster, it said, we're not rated X for nothing, baby, or something like that. I'm quoting it from memory, but it's on the poster, something like that. Needless to say, it was incredibly controversial. Cartoons were for kids, not for adults, right? This can't be X-rated. That's wrong. Oh my God. Oh, ah, you know what? Deal with it. I'm sure that was a sentiment of Ralph Bakshi, the guy who directed the film. This would also be his feature directorial debut. Let me tell you about Ralph. This guy kicked down the door in a big way for the genre of adult animation. And every adult animated cartoon or movie, from The Simpsons to Family Guy to South Park, have Ralph to thank for that. He laid down the foundation for what was to come later on. Now, to say that this movie faced an uphill battle would be an understatement. Securing funding for the film was difficult, to say the least, as many studios weren't willing to take that leap of faith. On top of financial issues, Robert Crumb and Ralph Bakshi came to creative blows over the story for the film, with the two having very different opinions when it came to creative preferences. Crumb hated the film so much that he sued to have his name removed from the credits and also even killed off Fritz in his comic. In order to protest the movie, he was like, I hate this film, and guess what? Fritz is dead. He's never coming back. See ya. Now, despite the difficult production, the film itself was a smashing success, and it would lead to a sequel. A sequel that both Crumb and Bakshi would have nothing to do with. The only creative leader involved from the first film was Steve Krantz, a producer, and he hired Robert Taylor to fill Bakshi's role. Now, Robert had previously worked on a show called The Mighty Heroes and did a fine job recreating the visual style and tone of the first Fritz movie, though the writing and stories would be another matter entirely. Funny enough, there's not much more to say about the origin of The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat. The film was released in June of 1974 
and was not nearly as successful, both critically or financially, compared to the first. <laughs> Get this, Ralph is even on record saying that Robert Crumb would never acknowledge the nine lives of Fritz the Cat because he would, quote, well, Ralph did do a better picture than nine lives. So to Robert Crumb, there is no nine lives. It doesn't exist. Ultimately, it was clear that the original Fritz the Cat film was superior and came from a more genuine place when it came to storytelling, personality, and its message. While the nine lives of Fritz the Cat was, well, not. All right, so what's the movie about? Well, before I recap the story, I feel that I should give a quick rundown of the first film, so y'all have some kind of context. Though I wouldn't say it's 100% required, but hey, it's better than nothing. The original Fritz is about, yeah, you got it, Fritz, some 20-something-year-old college student who has two things on his mind, drugs and sex. Well, I guess I would say three things, including himself. I mean, this guy is quite the narcissist and is incredibly vapid, though he fancies himself as some kind of new age philosopher. We follow his misadventures, from his wild sex with co-eds, to getting chased by cops, to hanging out with urban crows in Harlem, to banging urban crows in Harlem. Again, this movie is rated X for a reason, folks. Ultimately, Fritz gets caught up with a bunch of cracked out revolutionists who want to blow up a power plant, and he almost dies in the explosion. He then ends up at a hospital with what we believe are his final moments. But nope, Homeboy launches himself into another sexual romp with a bunch of ladies, and that's the movie. Sounds pretty wild, right? Well, it is. And you're most likely thinking, I bet the next movie is even crazier. I mean, yeah, I guess in a way. Let's talk about it. So the second film isn't as linear as the first, which is really saying something. If anything, the sequel is a bona fide anthology, where we see the past lives of Fritz and what he was up to. The film starts off with Fritz getting yelled at by what we assume to be his wife, and then Fritz, and I don't know how to put it, but I think he astral projects himself? And then we follow him as he recounts his previous lives. He was once a successful tycoon during the 1930s. He was once an astronaut going to Mars. He was once a Nazi stormtrooper and had a very awkward encounter with Hitler. And that's putting it lightly. There's even a reality where New Jersey secedes from the United States and was run by African Americans, which are, as just like the first one has it, represented by crows. And honestly, folks, <laughs> That's all there really is to the synopsis for this film. A bunch of non-linear episodes of Fritz gallivanting throughout time, and how he runs into trouble, and gets in over his head cause, you know, he's trying to get head. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad joke. I suppose a bad joke for a bad movie. So, what are my overall thoughts about The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat? Well, if it's not already abundantly clear, I did not really care for this movie. Allow me to explain. Now, the original film was far from perfect, but there were things in the movie that were creative, fun, and engaging. It weighed in on the political and cultural unrest from the 1960s and 70s, the popularity and rise of drug use, the emergence of neo-Nazis and revolutionists, a general distrust in the US government, and how cops were not really the favorite kinds of folks around people like Fritz and his cohorts. Overall, Fritz the Cat was able to commentate on these current events from that era through satire and anthropomorphic representation. Yes, the film can be offensive at times, and it absolutely takes full advantage of its X rating. But at least it was trying to say something, while also having fun and using cartoons to make these genuinely difficult topics more digestible for audiences. But The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat fails to capture that magic. Fritz was more fun as a whimsical, carefree asshole in the first movie, but now he is some loser dad, which is much more depressing than a loser bachelor. We see Fritz as a Nazi during the fall of Berlin, and there's a joke about Hitler being gay, cause that's funny, haha. <laughs> <laughs> gay! <sighs> 
I'm all for dunking on Hitler, but it wasn't very inspired in this film. It's just, hey, he's gay, lol. Also, there's this random segment where it has a white pig fighting a black crow. They're both standing on these rock pillars, and over time it fades down with their weapons, and I'm not sure what the film was getting at. Was it commentating on the futility of war? Was it talking about the gap between white people in America and black people and how they fight? Because to me, it's a pretty one-sided fight, to be honest. Or was it just for laughs? I, I, somehow, this film is both heavy-handed and cryptic at the exact same time. Cliché after cliché, Fritz extinguishes his nine lives, and he never seems to grow or take anything away from his previous experiences. Honestly, I think that's wasted potential. It could have been an interesting thread to explore, but nah, we're just gonna make gay jokes about Hitler and Satan instead. What a waste of a framing device. Now, I wasn't in love with Fritz from the first movie, but he was interesting enough with his lusting and his faux intellectualism to at least hold my attention as things got progressively worse for him due to his own bullshit. But it's not nearly as rewarding in the sequel. It's just quick episodes of Fritz being an ass with none of the charm. To the film's credit though, the animation in the film is fine, and it does a great job channeling the energy from the first movie. There are some trippy segments with creative interpretations of being high, though there are also segments, such as the 1930s portion, that run on for far too long. I swear, this part lasted for like 10 minutes, and it just has Fritz spinning his cane over footage of like the Dust Bowl and the stock market and FDR. I don't know what they're getting at, I guess to recap that decade, but it got boring to me. Another thing worth praising about the sequel is the music, which was very good and was done by Tom Scott and the LA Express. So at least there's that. But ultimately, The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat is a disappointing fever dream that lacks the personality and charisma of its predecessor. And whenever it does commentate on political or current events, it did so in a way that feels very surface level and isn't really saying anything at all. The original Fritz had some semblance of nuance with its commentary, but not the sequel. And that is why, in my eyes, it fails. In conclusion, The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat is a lesser son of a greater sire, which is my fancy way of saying that it's not as good as the original. To be honest, the first film wasn't perfect by any means, and is more known for being the first of its kind, rather than being the best. If anything, most folks know the first movie for being a trailblazer that showcased the possibilities of adult animated content and how it can be both critically and financially successful. But for the sequel, uh, no. It lacked all of the gritty charm, conviction, and novelty of the first film, but was somehow twice as pretentious and obnoxious. It missed the point of what made the original so special, and its only saving grace is the animation. Yes, it was the first R-rated animated film from the US, and that's worth acknowledging, but it was not nearly as inspired as the original Fritz the Cat. Now, is it worth checking out? <laughs> I mean, if you like weird animated movies, like me, then sure. But I would recommend lowering your expectations before you do, especially if you've seen the original, because, and I looked it up this time, uh, we're not R-rated for nothing, baby. <laughs> if R stood for regret, like the prophet of regret. Ah, I made a halo joke. <laughs> So, a big shout out to today's sponsor, Dr. Squatch. I, I was having a bit of a laugh, actually, where, follow me here, all right? You, you, you'll get to see me using the soap in this sponsorship. It's like Tom Kenny and SpongeBob. <laughs> no, uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Squatch for sponsoring this video. It's always a big help to be able to fund the channel, pay my editors, so thank you for that, and thanks to the viewers, you folks, for supporting the channel and watching and and also checking out these sponsors. Okay, here's the thing. All right, I'm just gonna say what I think. I think a lot of men don't take enough care of themselves when it comes to hygienics. As in, we do the bare minimum. And I'm sure there's exceptions, of course, but most of the time it's like shampoo, conditioner, eh, bar soap, I guess. 
um, brush my teeth and that's, but that's, that's call it a day versus like a lot of other girls who do so much more. And here's the thing. I think guys, we're missing out on a very positive experience when it comes to checking out the world of, of taking care of yourself, especially when it comes to hygiene. I love these soap bars. I, I got three. I, I use them. You'll see footage of me using them here in a bit. I, I got the pine tar. I got the deep sea goat's milk. And I got the grapefruit IPA. And all of these are made in America, organically, not using any of the big chemicals from like other soap companies. By the way, you can check the ingredients on the box. It is legit organic. There's a lot of chemicals that go into the, like, the typical soaps and, and shampoos and conditioners, not for Dr. Squatch. They wanna use the good stuff. They wanna, they're aiming for quality. And also, I, <laughs> out of all three of these, like, I realized when I was showering, I was like, I, I'm a fan of pine. The smell of pine, whether it be a car freshener or a soap bar, this is the one I love the most. Oh my God. I was like, the grapefruit IPA. Smells pretty good, I like it. All right, the deep sea goat milk. Nah, that's pretty damn good. Pine tar, I put it on, I was like, oh, this is it. This is the one. I felt so fresh coming out of the shower, being like, oh my God, I, is this, is this, <laughs> Is this Awakened Super Saiyan? What is it Goku says? Where he's like, is this Ultimate Saiyan? Or what is Goku saying when he's, I'm botching this meme so badly. When I walked out of the shower, after using the soap bars, after like really getting it all over my, my sexy body, I realized, wow, I've really been missing out. I think a lot of guys in our basic ass hygiene routine, we're not doing the best that we could do for ourselves. And we're kind of denying ourselves a quality experience of, of feeling good, smelling good. It just, know, puts a little pep of your step too, where it's like, I feel good this morning. I smell good. I feel it coursing through my veins, the, the power of pine tar. So, I pride myself that I will not promote something that I wouldn't personally use and endorse. As in, I like this stuff. I genuinely do. I was excited to check it out. I was like, finally, I get to actually use better soap. That was something on my to-do list that I've put off for far too long. And then Dr. Squatch is like, hey, here's some soap bars, check it out. I'm like, oh, good timing. I've desperately needed to upgrade my routine when it comes to showers and bathing and just hygiene in general. So my daily routine has been improved and I really like it. I'm always a fan of this policy when it comes to companies. Dr. Squatch said, if you don't think that this soap bar is the best soap bar you've ever used, full refund, no questions asked, money's back to you. I like it when companies declare their confidence in their products and services, and Dr. Squatch does that. They're like, no, you're gonna like this. We use good ingredients, natural ingredients, none of that weird chemical stuff. We want you to be happy. We want you to make sure that you're content, not just content, that very satisfied with these products. And they stand by that. So I, I always appreciate that kind of confidence once more when it comes to a company and their products and Dr. Squatch does that. So again, I highly recommend Dr. Squatch. I'm a big fan. I will keep using these soap bars. I might get some more here because again, it is nice to upgrade my routine. It makes me feel cleaner and sexier and more confident. I know it sounds weird, but like, it's just, I do, I do it. I, I was hyped in the show. I'm like, yes, I feel like I, I, I matter and I'm taking good care of myself. So if you are a new customer, I encourage you to check it out. Go to drsquatch.com, use my personal code, DSC Sabrespark. If you get an order that's over $20, as a new customer, you can get 20% off that order. I smell nice. And I even got naked in the shower for you all. That's how dedicated I am to declaring my endorsement of Dr. Squatch. So I highly recommend it. Go check it out.